Here. Well, I'm delighted to be here, uh, honored to be invited to be here. And, uh, but I, I got to tell you, I will disappoint you with my talk. First of all, I'm a horribly boring speaker, but <clears throat> so that's a guarantee of, uh, of disappointment. But also, if this meeting had been just a little later, we could have been talking about the 2010 census results. So uh, I'm not going to do that. That would be inappropriate. In fact, you know, I don't even know them. Uh, with each uh, day, the number of people that know the answer to that you want to know uh, is getting smaller and smaller. We have uh, heavy security at the Census Bureau these days and uh, people who aren't allowed to go home and stuff like that. So. <laughs> Um, but in this room, gee, when was it, Kathy? Uh, Monday, Monday. This week, this right? Week, yeah, Monday. lost track now. In this room, uh, Monday, we announced the results of the demographic analysis of 2010. Now, what does that mean? Uh, those are estimates at the national level only. It isn't broken down by race, ethnicity. Based on the vital registration system, birth registration, death registration of the total population. And we did something that I'm proud of this time. Uh, first of all, we released it before the census to absolutely clearly demonstrate that this is an independent measurement device. Secondly, uh, although you may not like this, we, we portrayed five different estimates because it is very difficult in this country to estimate uh, the number of end migrants to the country. And uh, in gathering the best demographic minds around the country together last January, there was an agreement that uh, choosing one number for the end migrant total would uh, be a leap of faith or the uh, designation uh, that uh, one of these people who uh, had one number in, in his or her head was the right one. So we actually uh, produced five different estimates. In just uh, a matter of days, uh, we will uh, fulfill our obligation of giving to you the uh, state population counts. And at the very same moment, at that instant, uh, out on the web will be flashed the number of representatives under the reapportioned House of Representatives. Okay, so we're charged with that arithmetic. In fact, we just put up a real cool video on our website. It's also on the Washington Post website of how the reapportionment process works. And I'd be willing to bet that 90% of you don't know exactly how it actually involves a square root. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to disappoint you a little. I, I, won't, uh, I, I won't give you 2010 stuff. I will tell you my favorite. 2010 census story. Some of you, there are familiar faces in this audience. Some of you know this story already, but I can't resist. Um, in rural areas of the country, instead of mailing out a questionnaire, my hunch is almost all of you got a questionnaire by mail, um, you know, in March. We actually deliver the questionnaires by hand. And that's because the postal system gets a little sketchy in certain rural areas of, of the country. And we can't guarantee delivery. So one of our staff members in the uh, upper part of Michigan, uh, this has nothing to do with the fact that I'm from the state of Michigan, by the way. <laughs> if you've ever been to upper Michigan, you, you know that it's just miles and miles of pine trees. No one lives up there much. Uh, it's a rugged area, mainly dirt roads, and so one of our staff members was driving down these dirt roads. We supply them with a map with little spots on it where there, there are houses, so she was trying to find this house. She was going down, and, it, and the map directed her to turn right, so she turns right, and she comes to an even smaller dirt road, and as she's driving down this very straight dirt road, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and finally, in the middle of the woods, it just stops. It just ends. The road ends. She's pretty sure she's not near this house. Uh, she's kind of flustered, uh, but ahead of her, she sees there's a little trail going into the pines, so she takes out her enumerator's bag, and walking into the woods, the dark woods, and there, you know, after about a half a mile in, she sees there in the distance, there's a little cabin. She sees a wood cabin, so, you know, her heart is racing. 
She's walking up to the cabin, and, and we give them little plastic bags uh, filled uh, that have the questionnaire and has a little door hanger on it, you know, so you're supposed to put it on the doorknob. So she's taking out the plastic bag. She's walking up to the door, and there on the doorknob, she sees the census form from the year 2000. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that, I mean, it's like four stories at once, right? Uh, so uh, I'm going to tell you a little about 2010. And uh, the first thing I want to tell you about 2010 is there are people in this room who are the heroes of the 2010 census. You know who you are. There are people who devoted hundreds and thousands of hours to get the word out to communities all over this country. Uh, communities defined by language subgroups, by cultural subgroups, and so on. And they made the difference. Uh, the Census Bureau has learned that a census, a decennial census run out of Washington is a failure. It has to be, you know, the ideal census is that every group, every neighborhood, uh, thinks it's their census, that they are taking their census. And when that happens, it works. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't work. And we tried real hard, as, as hard as we could. Uh, we're gradually getting better at this, I think, to, to make that happen. But there are people in this room uh, that uh, certainly made it happen for their groups, and I, I want to I want to thank you. So I'm going to say a little about this. I'm, I'm going to disappoint you. I'm going to show you a lot of graphs and data. It's great to be in a room of data geeks, by the way. By the way, this got data thing that you have, if all of you go to www.amstat.org, you can order a t-shirt that says got data from the Statistical Association. So and this, this is not a nerdy idea. Well, it is a nerdy idea. <laughs> so, so do it. I don't know how much they cost, but they're, they're kind of neat. I have one. I found in wearing it, you need to choose the locale that you wear this shirt. <laughs> Uh, so I'll tell you about uh, mainly our population estimates program and the American Community Survey. Uh, uh, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to leap over and address some concerns that I know or issues that I know exist in this group. So uh, first about, about 2010. Uh, the data collection process is over on 2010. I am uh, overjoyed that after a rough start uh, in the spring of 2009 where we had some scheduling and budget problems uh, uh, throughout the key year, everything we did was on schedule. Uh, all but one operation uh, was under budget. The uh, mailback rates, um, I lost money on the mailback rates of the, of the year 2010. I had no uh, imagination that we could achieve as a American public the rate we did. Uh, it, it tied the 2000 rate and uh, you know one of the things I do in my spare time is watch non-response rates of surveys around the world. Talk about geeky. <laughs> uh, and they're all going down. In, in Western society, response rates are declining. Our own American community survey mailback rate has, has declined by five percentage points in the 10-year period. But we did, as a country, uh, meet the same thing we did in 2000. So I, I lost a lot of money on this one. We do have more proxy response in the non-response follow-up stage. This is really inside baseball sort of stuff. If you don't mail back the questionnaire, we knock on your door. In fact, um, the American, if you look at my email box, for many people, we knocked on their door a little too much. Uh, but we do that to make sure we measure everyone. And if we can't get a hold of you, we actually seek information about who lives in your unit from a building manager or a neighbor or something like that. We had, this was a, a greater prevalence. This was about 22% of the follow-up cases uh, this time versus 17% last time. This is not a good sign. Um, but I can tell you we, we now know a little more than I knew when we first uh, had that result. 
we're, uh, there are two things that are good that we know already. Your efforts working in hard to count areas and a bunch of other efforts are advertising, targeting hard to count populations worked. The, follow, the replacement form worked. The variation across areas in the mail back rate is smaller this time. And if you, if you think about this for a minute, the plague of every census is differential undercount, right? If we had uniform response in the country, that's a good property of a census, and we're, we're tighter on this this time than last time. And then I now know, uh, just yesterday, in fact, I know, that we have less variation across areas, and here think of things like census tracts, in the completion of the population counts, including non-response follow-up. This is good news for us, okay? We don't know how good it is, uh, but this is the direction we'd, we'd like, so I'm hopeful. And then um, the next bullet is, we, we already know that the match of the forgive all this jargon, but we do something called a post-enumeration survey. This is how we estimate net undercount. We already know that the match, the household level match of that operation versus the census is better than it was in 2000. That means missing full misses of households or, or missing full households is less problematic this time than last time. So all of those are kind of good signals. Um, and then I'm really proud, and Secretary Locke is more than really proud of uh, having returned uh, one, it's actually more than $1.6 billion uh, uh, to, uh, to all of us through the Treasury uh, that we didn't need. Now, this is all not uh, pats on our back. We had $800 million in a contingency fund. Uh, remember, a few months ago, we all thought the H1N1 epidemic would shut down this country. Uh, we had to worry about hurricanes in the South. Uh, we have done censuses where there were massive er earthquakes that just wiped out areas. So we had a $800 million contingency fund for all of those horrible things. It turns out nothing happened, and we gave that back. And then we saved about $800 million through, uh, my view on this is through the American public. Uh, that, their behavior made us do, have to do less things. And whenever that happens, you save money. And uh, being good stewards of the taxpayers' money, we gave it back. So we're proud of that. Now, what's gonna happen? Um, I think Monday, although I've lost track of time. Is Burton here? Okay, Monday. Monday, we will announce uh, when we will distribute the state count. <laughs> Only the Census Bureau would do this, right? Uh, it, we will make the December 31st schedule. Uh, this, will, this gets a little news attention. Uh, so you could go to our website Monday or just pop into, if you have a Google search thing, it'll pick it up. And uh, this, if you think about it for a minute, uh, isn't a lot of data. You won't get really excited about this. It's just population uh, counts at the state level. Uh, this is our fulfillment of the constitutional requirement of giving data to reapportion the House. This is, by the way, why we do a census. Uh, it's not. Uh, as they told James Madison in 1790, this is not a social science research study. This is something to reapportion the House of Representatives. Uh, by the way, he, they said that to him because he wanted to ask occupation in the 1790 census, and they didn't like that. <laughs> so the debates of content were always with us. Um, then what's gonna happen? In February through March, things will get interesting. You'll like the data we deliver February through March. State by state, we'll have block level data, block level counts, and those counts uh, will take with them uh, race ethnicity breakdowns for the implementation of the Voting Rights Act. This is given to the states. 
We have nothing to do with redistricting, but we give data to the states for redistricting. This decade, there's a new feature also in that a little uh, about the same time, we will release at the block level counts of members of group quarters, one group quarters of intense in interest uh, politically, and that is prisons. You may be aware of the concern uh, among some uh, who are redistricting that although prisons in this country tend to be located in rural areas, most people believe that the prisoners come, come from urban areas. So if you worry about political representation and you live in an urban area, uh, you may feel that you are being cheated by having prisoners counted in the rural areas. So we're releasing this for the first time. And I can tell you already, every state is handling this in a different way. It will be a very interesting time. I'm glad I'm not involved in this. A very interesting time to watch the redistricting process. And those of you who are lawyers, it may be good to devote uh, the next 10 years to redistricting law. I suspect you could make some money. Uh, and then in the spring and summer, you'll, you'll get the kind of things you're really thirsting for, and we are too. These will be profiles that will really be quite, quite informative and will, will generate other um, reports based on that. So let me um, kind of go through things that some in this room actually know better than I. So when I misspeak, you should correct me. Uh, don't, uh, don't be shy. Uh, but it is what we, what we have now. And it will take us up to 2008, 2009. And then I'm going to show you some forecasts. And uh, I need to remind all of us about the measurement process. This, this goes to Directive 15 kinds of stuff. Uh, since 2000, since the ability to measure race and ethnicity, uh, allowing us to choose multiple categories, we have now a more complicated uh, reporting of, of race and ethnicity. We have this notion of uh, a single race alone. This is the jargon that has uh, come up. And then a particular race alone or in combination with other races. So. If I mark myself down as multiple races, uh, I would be labeled that I am uh, a race in combination with others. And so there are two categorizations that I'm going to show you. I'll show you Asian alone, for example, and then Asian, in combina Asian alone in combination with others, or in combination with others. Uh, so let me, let me start kind of going through things. These are are from our population estimates program. Now, what, is, what are population estimates? They, they're based on the year 2000 census and then updated annually using data uh, from vital registration and, and in migration. Uh, this is the year 2000 through 2009. You can see this breakdown on the, on the, the orange side are Asian alone and then on the green is Asian in, in, uh, or in combination with others, uh, 2000 through 2009. Uh, depending on what series you look at, this is about a 32% growth over this 10-year uh, period. The country as a whole over the same period was growing at about a 9% rate. So it is a growing subpop that you know this better than I. Uh, it's fun to look at this in terms of graphics. Let me see how bad that came out. So I'm going to, this is the year 2000. The dark, uh, if you look at the legend, the very darkest is 20% uh, or more in a county. These are county units, okay? This is 2000, okay? This is Asian alone or in combination. And then I'm going to show you 2009, and I'm going to go back and forth, or 2008, I think. Oop. <laughs> this is 2008. This is 2000. This is 2008. This is 2000. This is 2000. <laughs> okay, do you, I mean, focus in, focus in, avoid your eyes uh, on the coast. Look at kind of the center of the country. Okay, 2000, 2008, 2000, 2008. <laughs> 
And if you wanted to measure change, it looks like this. So the darkest blue are 100% or more change in the counts. And, and so let your eyes go to the coasts again and then go to the middle. You know, th th uh, this is something that's happening with a whole lot of uh, racial and ethnic minorities. It is the dispersion uh, of the population everywhere. And, uh, you know, I had the wonderful honor of learning this myself. You know, I've been all over this country uh, over the last uh, year or so in little bitty towns. Uh, and, you know, I, w I went to Gastonia, North Carolina, and met with the Hmong population of Gastonia, North Carolina. <laughs> you know, uh, who would have, you know, who would have thought? <laughs> Uh, so we, we are becoming a diverse country, and we are becoming diverse everywhere. The diversity of the diversity is in, increasing, and uh, uh, that's really interesting. The, the, uh, the counties that showed the biggest growth, so if you took all the counties that had at least 10,000 Asian Americans, the largest growth over this period was in Loudoun County, Virginia, not very far from here. So keep in mind Virginia. Brazoria, Texas, <laughs> and Pasco, Florida. Okay. So what's the story there? It's all over the place. You know, it's just, uh, there's no rhyme or reason to these counties. Uh, every county is experiencing this, and it's all over the country. Uh, if you talk about population growth of the Asian population and ask what's driving it, uh, here, uh, you, uh, uh, here you have to be real careful. This is the contribution of the Asian population to, uh, uh, to overall change, okay? So if you look to the left of the black line, you can see that it's uh, you know 13 to 16 percent of total change in the population is due to change in the Asian population. That's the way to think about that. And then if you go to the right and say, how is this happening? You can see net inter uh, international migration is the driver on this population. Uh, that's a distinctive attribute of the growth. Okay, so to the left what percentage of the total growth in the country is due to Asians, and then to the right, why is it happening, or what are the sources, okay? Um, we also do population projections. We have a great group of demographers. Some of them are always thinking 50 years out. They're a special breed, by the way. <laughs> and if you go uh, to 2050, uh, this is the kind of projections we make. Now, how in the world can you make a population projection out to 2050? Uh, these people won't bet their houses on the accuracy of these forecasts. Uh, and they would say, we assume that the fertility rates of the population are sort of what they are now relative other populations, that the in and out migration, that the mortality rate. So assuming what is happening now continues and what is happening to other subpopulations continues. This is what we think is going to happen. If you go to the left-hand side, this is about 4% of the total population. If you go to the right-hand side, it's 8 to 9% of the full population, right? So, so prevalence is projected uh, uh, to, to continue itself. Now let's move, these were all, uh, uh, Asian figures, let's, let's move to Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and do the same thing. Uh, these are populations in millions from the Population Estimates Program, the same thing. Uh, this is about a 25% growth rate again, over this period compared to a 9% overall national growth rate, a little different than uh, the last one. Uh, same little map game. Uh, uh, this is, the legend is different here though, be careful, okay, so this is 5% or more, this is a much smaller population in prevalence, 5% or more, and look at the uh, west coast, and look at Hawaii down here, right, that better be, that better be uh, 
purple or whatever this is. <laughs> so are you ready for 2008? This is really interesting. It, it looks like they're just moving. <laughs> There's a little movement west, but uh, Hawaii doesn't change at all. Look at Alaska, by the way. <laughs> and if you look at change, uh, it, it looks, again, sort of like the last one we saw. These are percent changes, OK, uh, for, for this population. And if you ask the question, what are the three counties with the largest percentage growth among those uh, that have 10,000 or more Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders? Riverside, California, West Coast. Maricopa, Arizona. That's that move over to an adjacent state, sort of. And Clark County, Nevada, right? So different. Uh, and I can't wait to see 2030 and 2040. I'd love to see 2050. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt if I'll be here. Uh, so what about the nature of population growth? It's a, uh, the, com the, the contribution to overall national growth from this population is smaller, as you'd imagine. The source of growth going to the right is quite different, right? Remember on the, on the Asian population, it was this international migration dominating things. This is natural increase in this population. So it's quite, quite different. Um, if you look at uh, projections again, This is a movement, this is a, a large change from less than half a million up to, well, you see the figures over on the right. Now, what's horrible about what I just said over the past is that I, I, I didn't drill down. And with the American Community Survey, you can drill in a way that's really neat. In fact, I could have done the entire presentation many times for subgroups. And that is the value of, of the American Community Survey. Now, th there are good things and bad things about the American Community Survey. What are the good things? This is a large, continuous sample survey. For small populations, you can accumulate over adjacent months and years in a way that we couldn't do before. You can get more timely estimates. The bad things about the American Community Survey is that it's still a sample survey. So you know this, but some of your colleagues aren't sensitive to this last column. What is this last column? Uh, this is a so-called margin of error, and you can think of it as a uh, for the real statistical geeks, a 90% confidence interval. And a useful thing to do, especially for the kind of users you deal with who are not data geeks like you are, is to remind them of that column. So just look at the size of that column versus the size of the estimate. These estimates are wobbly. They're uncertain. They're a little noisy. For small populations, the sample is smaller. The estimates are noisier, wobblier. So to be good um, agents uh, for your community, you have to protect your community from that wobbliness. You really need to attend to the margins of error. For annual estimates for very small populations, the noise is great. For three-year estimates, it's smaller. For five-year estimates, it's even smaller. But when you go from one year to three year to five years, you're also losing right, uh, a small time period to describe the population of, of interest. That's the trade-off. Monday, is it Monday or Tuesday? Tuesday. <laughs> If it's Tuesday, I must be in. <laughs> Tuesday, we are going to release 
11 billion estimates. If you count the margins of error, 22 billion <laughs> estimates. This, I believe, is the largest release of estimates in the history of mankind. We will give five-year estimates down to block group levels from the American Community Survey. We've never done this before. This is really cool. But for some of your, uh, some of the populations you're interested in, those estimates, even those estimates, right, at a very small area will actually be suppressed because we don't have enough cases to, re to, re uh, to report an estimate for the population you care about for a block group. You'll have to, I, I ask you, I guess, politely to help us on this. Uh, and uh, what you can do as a uh, social scientist is make sure you teach people that when you aggregate over block groups, you're aggregating to larger samples and the, and the estimates become more stable. Uh, so their ag geographical aggregation will be the tool to get more stable estimates. We're actually going to release pretty unstable estimates deliberately to give folks like you the ability to accumulate in ways that you want to accumulate. Right? You can put together building blocks of block groups in any way you want. You can describe the geographical space you want to describe because you'll have the building blocks. But you're going to find you're going to have to aggregate up uh, pretty much uh, to do this. So uh, this is a plug for the American Community Survey, uh, which I think we're going to need to plug over the next few months. Uh, it is an expensive survey. It does ask uh, people to give up their time to answer a long questionnaire. But it will be the country's source of up-to-date data. From now on, every year for your block group, you're going to get a new estimate of the last five years. So next year, we're going to release, uh, this is, uh, Next Monday, we'll release 2005 through 2009 period estimates. The next year will be 2006 through 2010. The year after that will be 2007 through 2011. So you're always going to know about your area over the last five years. The real wealth of that will be obvious after we've seen this for 10 years. You'll have a time series of your block group. That's really neat, you know? We've never had this before. Before, we, we, we gave us data once every 10 years for your block group. It was really cool the first time you saw it, but then it got old fast, truly old, and became inaccurate. You know, in the years that ended in eight, you were looking at data from the year zero, and nobody b believed anything about that, justifiably. So we're trying to get better. Okay. So let me go on. I'm probably, am I way screwed up on time? Yeah. <laughs> okay, you're, you're so polite. I am way, <laughs> I'm way screwed up on time. So let, let me just run through some uh, other things that I, I think you might be interested in. These are now American Community Survey data. Um, so uh, looking at, let's look at household type uh, for the Asian population. This is a little different. Look at the pink, is it pink up there, sort of pink? Uh, this is the total US population. So one thing to do is just focus on pink versus non-pink uh, and kind of move your eyes across the chart, OK? So pink is everybody. Uh, you're more interested in the right side. And you see total family households uh, more prevalent in the, in the Asian uh, population. And you see how uh, the difference is across there. Let's switch to Native Hawaiian and uh, Pacific Islanders, uh, similar kind of, of, of contrast. Let's look at nativity, Asian, uh, foreign-born versus uh, native. So look on the right, foreign-born roughly in the 60% uh, to two-thirds uh, level. Native Hawaiians obviously completely uh, different than that. Look at educational attainment, pink, non-pink. Say, go way over to the right. 
a bachelor's degree or more. These are averages. You know this contrast, uh, a, a much more educated population than the US in general. Look at native Hawaiian, a different contrast between pink, non-pink. Um, let's look at median earnings. And these are medians, to go back to uh, the introduction. This doesn't look at percentiles, so it would be very interesting to see the distribution of earnings in the population, not just medians. Uh, but there, the this is male versus uh, uh, male and female contrasts, uh, national versus total, or national versus uh, Asian, uh, Native uh, Hawaiian and, and Pacific Islanders, a different contrast. Uh, so those are American community surveys uh, data. And even now, you could go and drill down. So I can say the same thing. If you if you want to look at a particular Asian subgroup, you can go on the American Fact Finder, build your own tables that have those, uh, and uh, wait till Monday, and you'll be able to go crazy for a long time. All right, With 11 billion estimates, there's some in there for you, I guarantee. I want to uh, address a, a couple of other things. Um, uh, and this is all by way of what we're trying to do at the Census Bureau uh, right now. We have been blessed uh, with a set of race and eth ethnic group advisory committees. And let me tell you how valuable they have been for us. First of all, they've given us advice. They've kept us sensitive uh, uh, to diverse challenges in measuring the population. They helped us on translating instruments, uh, uh, especially for the decennial census. They uh, uh, down to individual pictures on posters, uh, gave us advice on how we should advertise for different, different groups. Uh, they, are, uh, they have been very helpful in, in giving us routes into networks and community-based organizations. Uh, so they are a key component to keeping us honest and smart. Um, I didn't make any appointment or reappointments to this to these groups in the middle of the census. I wanted to keep the the crew who had been, uh, you know, well schooled in in uh, what we're about. We're filling vacancies on those committees now. This is something I know the committee uh, uh, is concerned about as we go forward and prepare uh, for the planning. Believe it or not, of the 2020 census, we are beginning that. Uh, but for other agencies, I, I want to put in a plug on uh, how informative and useful as a director of an agency these groups can be. Uh, they're feisty, <laughs> uh, and they tell it like it is, and that's what we need. Every once in a while, we need to be slapped up a little bit, uh, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, I also want to say a few things about what we're trying to do on minority representation in the staff. If you look at our numbers, if you just look at numbers, uh, at the headquarters, we're roughly, a, you know, we're flirting with a 10% uh, representation of the Asian population. Uh, that's at, at headquarters. Over the last few months, uh, we have brought in uh, companies and other federal agencies uh, who have been labeled as doing better than we are on uh, minority hiring. Um, so this has been Google, and I think it was Xerox. I've forgotten uh, many of them. Actually, the, the diversity head of Google was really interesting. She had worked for Google four years. She had worked for Google longer than 99% of the people who worked at Google. <laughs> Uh, that doesn't look like a federal agency. Uh, so uh, we learned something from that. Let me tell you what we think we learned. The companies that really do this well have created recruitment tools that are outside the company. Uh, they've used workers inside uh, who are of the group that uh, is, is to be targeted for the recruitment. Uh, but they've, they've created all sorts of mechanisms to get applicant pools 
So if, if I diagnose our problem uh, at the Census Bureau, it's the applicant pool. Uh, we're not reaching out to get a, a strong applicant pool on this, and we need help. And I would submit uh, one tool for us in the future is using the, the uh, race and ethnic advisory committees. This is going to be a favor we're going to ask of them to put in a little work uh, to help us on this uh, to get a stronger applicant pool. And uh, so we want to take advantage of that. And then there are bunches of, of other ideas, really cool ideas, I think, that we can uh, uh, can take on. So we're, we're going to work on this. And then let me end with uh, uh, a neat thing that I think we should be proud of. We, we have um, centers called census information centers. The purpose of these is to uh, foster and expand the dissemination of census data to uh, racial and cultural and ethnic uh, subgroups. Uh, there are 52 of these now around the country. This is really neat, I think. 12 of them are, are Asian American Pacific Islander. We don't offer a lot of money on this, I gotta tell you. We don't, we're not budgeted to do this. But what we do is to send data out and uh, give advice on how to, how to use our tools to focus in on that. And what the CICs, we call these CICs, what these CICs do is to reach out to the community and just pump data into the community about the community. Uh, this is a loose organization that gets together. We pay for them to have a, a meetings. I know the group right now is, is interested in trying to garner funds from private foundations and, and to the extent this is legal, we'll help them uh, do that. I think it's a neat thing. And uh, I'm telling you this uh, because if there are opportunities that you see in your organization or on your campus that could foster and encourage the development of su such a center, we'd, we'd be happy to, to hear from you. So that's what I wanted to say. and. I'll end with some of our beautiful, or at least I like them, uh, posters that we use during the decennial and would welcome your questions. So how, how bad are we on time? How, how many minutes should? Oh, OK, it's better than I thought. 15 minutes, I'm told, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the excellent presentation. I'm Gilbert G. I'm a faculty member at UCLA. Um, and I've always admired the work that the census does and how careful they are with everything. But when I go to the census website and when I look at a lot of census publications, I often get, I, I pause and be fuddled when I look at the race uh, ethnicity estimates. Because when you look at the, when you just pull up anything, it starts off with white, black, um, American Indian, Asian, Pacific Islander, multiple race, and then et cetera. And the question that always stops me is, how are those groups sorted? It's not sorted alphabetically. It's not sorted by population size. It's not sorted by who's, here, who's been on this land first. So I'm wondering if you have any insight into how that's sorted. And if it's arbitrary, as that was my best guess, what message I get from that is it tells us who we believe is most important. And if that's the case, I think that's not necessarily the right message. Uh, I don't know the answer to your question. I truly don't. I mean, I could speculate. Um, and I don't know whether they match the order of the categories of responses. You probably do better than I. Uh, and then you're going to ask me who determined the order of the response categories, and I don't know that. That's oh, an interesting point. I, th I think you could apply the same thing. So, you know, if you go to America, you've obviously gone to American Fact Finder, and there are right. thousands of tables, or it seems like thousands of tables. Same thing can apply on what variables are mentioned first. 
and I've gotten uh, you know, comments from the economists who say, why aren't all the economic data first? You know, I have to search for it. And, and the sociologists say, you know, I don't like these sort of, uh, I don't know what to do about that. Um, and and I, I can find, if you contact me, I'll try to get an answer to your question. Uh, I, I guess I do, well, I'm not even gonna speculate. I hope the order is not uh, determined by what someone thought was the most important group, but I doubt it. Maybe you know the answer to this. No, I don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but I do think most of the data are emphatically uh, organized. Uh, I'm Wei Li, Arizona State University, also react. So thanks, Dr. Grove. Yeah, this for... is one of our heroes, by the way. You should applaud <laughs> Thank this you. woman. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. There are many, many of our colleagues who are here, but I do want to set, to tell everyone Dr. Grove has made instrumental change, not just to our REACT, but also Census Bureau as well. So I do want to thank you for that and all Census Bureau employees. This is our Tom Lu here is the uh, coordinator for all the five REACT members. But and, and the, as a geographer, I do want to thank you for showing those beautiful maps your ge ge geography division does. But I do have a question, kind of follow up to our REACT meeting two months ago in terms of the mandatory ACS, given the, the Canadian long form census being strapped. And also, we discussed the new Congress may have that mandate. So, I just would like to hear from you from the Bureau perspective if that become a a mandate from the new Congress, are there any contingency plan or how that going to impact the, to, the whole planning, ACS planning implementation? Because even my colleagues who have a PhD, many of them don't know ACS currently is a mandate as part of the Constitution mandate. But if that's changed, the entire, our the entire data, data structure and the reliability, reliability will change dramatically. So I'm just curious yeah. if you may comment you're, on that. You're a to the way, <laughs> To the way you can. Uh, Thank you. Well, I can't say much about this. The, uh, I can say it is a matter of fact. Uh, that the Republican National Committee in August, as one of their resolutions, uh, passed a resolution to abolish the ACS, and if they're unsuccessful on that, to make it voluntary. Um, and that is a matter of record, I guess. Uh, I know of no, uh, nothing has happened uh, to this uh, since that event, but I can't predict the future. So uh, all of us that care about the ACS, we're, we're actually doing some analysis right now. There was a quasi experiment in 2003 that for a few months made ACS voluntary. Uh, the finding there was uh, the response rate went down, as you might expect, and the finding uh, said that if you wanted to restore the data set size to what it was for a mandatory thing, you'd have to spend much more money. All right, that's the finding. We're reanalyzing those data to address another question, which is an important statistical question. Would you make different conclusions from a voluntary? That, see, the first thing I, found, I said was all about cost and response rate. That doesn't necessarily mean the conclusions would be different from. We're doing those analyses uh, even as we speak. I met with folks uh, yesterday at about 4.30 about that. and. Um, in, in a matter of uh, weeks, hopefully, we'll have, we'll have that answer. Thank you. Uh, Belford Lawson, Federal Communications Commission. And uh, let me digress briefly before asking my question. The Federal Communications Commission does outreach to the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community, particularly about technology. So if any of you, if any of you have any interest in how to implement uh, new relevant technology for the growth of AAPI communities. The FCC is a source of information for free. But my question is, um, can you comment based on the increase in the size and the increase in geographical distribution of uh, AAPI uh, populations, um, anything about the foreseeable impact 
on American political, and education, and cultural institutions. Does this increased size and diversity of these populations suggest anything to you about the consequences for American politics, education, and culture? Gee, I thought you were a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> this is a former, they're a fellow of federal. No. <laughs> uh, any other? No, I mean, I don't do that. Uh, the Census Bureau is a nonpartisan. We are fiercely nonpartisan. In fact, if you ask me what states are likely to win or lose members, I am the worst person to ask. I, I don't read those stories. I don't do that. You know, I used to do that, but I don't do that now. Paul. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, Here's another hero, by the uh, way. No, I'm not, but I'm going to be uncharacteristically unfeisty as a member of your REACT committee. And first of all... Uh, oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, about that. <laughs> Uh, which is to say, uh, I, I hope a lot of people in this room that from various agencies uh, will listen to your advice about uh, the possibility of creating REACT type structures. I don't know, to be honest, to the extent to which they exist in other agencies in the federal government. Uh, but I hope that they get established. Uh, but establishing them is not the most important thing. I think Wei Li has pointed out to have some leadership that supports them. And, and in that regard, I, I, I applaud you very much. Uh, the question I have is this, uh, moving forward to 2020, uh, the Census Bureau I know, as other agencies, is thinking about how to be not only more effective, but more efficient and cost effective. And as I understand it, a variety of different ideas are being considered, particularly, for example, about the increased use of administrative records as a possibility in terms of, of, of determining the count. And my question is, do you have any idea about if we move in that direction of using some of these other alternatives about what the particular impact might be on Asian Americans? I mean, for example, I don't know the answer to this question. What is the status of administrative records in particular, say, for Asian Americans? Uh, is the data good? Is it not very good? Is it complete? Is it not very complete? Because it seems it would have a potential differential impact on various communities if, if we move in that direction. Yeah. Okay, let, let me go back a couple of steps because uh, you're, a, you're a deeply informed uh, person. If you look at what's happening to censuses around the world, in fact, if you go to the, I think it's the UN Statistical Division, you could look at the design of censuses around the world. They're changing as time goes on. Increasingly, um, they are a mix of reaching out and asking you to self-report who lives in your house, and when that doesn't work well, using other data to replace your answers or your lack of answers with those um, answers. So this, this is true in, in almost all of Western Europe. You know, in parts of Western Europe, they've stopped doing censuses. Do you know this? Because their population registration system gives them daily how many people are in the country. So we're going to be different because we have a constitutional requirement to do a census every 10 years. My hunch is people aren't going to change that. There won't be an amendment to the Constitution on this one. So we're always going to do a census. I think we'll be distinctive on that score. But there's something else different about us. And I, if you look at the costs of censuses around the world, we are distinctive. Our cost inflation is, like, is unlike any other country. Our costs are rising at a rate that look unlike anything. If you look at Canada, in fact, it's absolutely dead flat. They do a census every five years. They're doing it for the same amount of money every five years. So what's happening here? Well, we have a use of a census that's really quite uh, also somewhat distinct, and that is we distribute political power based on the counts. Right? And we have this notion of a one person, one vote. Our legislative districts uh, have a rough mandate to be equal size. This isn't true. For, for example, in the UK, an electoral district respects com uh, traditional community boundaries. And the number of people in each district is highly variable. The UK society is put up with that. They, they're okay with that. 
So our census has become quite controversial on two levels, and the two levels are linked. The costs, so we are, we are seeing cost inflation uh, that sees no end under the current design. Now, why are we spending more money? We're spending more money because we're mounting follow-up operations. We ask you, we send you a mail questionnaire. You don't mail it back. We knock on your door. We don't get you. We knock on your door again. Uh, we come back. If you report in your household any little anomaly about, if, if you actually answer questions in a contradictory way, we call you back. Other countries don't do this, I can tell you. If you look at our net undercount rate, we're producing dynamite censuses. We are world class on that criterion. And these are numbers. You can compare us across the, across the country. So we have a world class census at the highest cost of the world. <laughs> so you don't, if you're reading any papers these days, there's an issue about whether we can continue this rate. So I, uh, as, a, as an official statistician, believe it's my obligation to address that cost inflation. We are attempting to mount a very serious scientific set of scientific studies that ask uh, the trade-off of that. Can we find other ways of getting as good of a census as we have now that's cheaper? One tool is administrative records. And now I'm finally going to answer your question, Paul. One of the things we're doing, uh, even as we speak, is to, in a post hoc way, simulate a 2010 census using all the administrative records we can get access to. And we will answer, it, not perfectly, but in a helpful way, I think the kinds of questions that you're asking. What kinds of people aren't on these records? Those will be the people that we'll have to target in some other way. And then we'll have to answer, can you target them? I mean, do you know where to reach out to get them? That'll be the challenge to us. I promise you, while I'm around, we'll do this in a completely transparent way. We're going to try to estimate the cost savings as well as the impact. But somehow, the society has to find a way of asking and answering a very important question. We know that censuses aren't perfect. There is no census that has ever been taken that has been perfect. But what we haven't answered is the question is, how good does it have to be to be good enough for its purposes? And if we demand perfection, we cannot achieve cost efficiency. I know what we're going to do. If, if, if the society says, you must count every one of us, or I reject the process, uh, we, this cost inflation will eventually reach the Department of Defense levels. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure I, uh, as a member of a society, would say, gee, should we spend that much money, rather spend using that money to help people who really need help, rather than counting them, you know? So that's the discussion we need to have, and we need your help on that discussion, because you care deeply about getting population counts, and I care deeply about it too, but I also know um, that we have to do it in the smartest way possible, and this is not just a statistical problem. This is partly a, 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 you know, a problem of the society that we've got to work on. That was a very long answer, I'm sorry. And I ate up my time, I bet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Now, Sella is really tough. You don't know what you just did. I know, I know. We're actually already here. Okay. So, uh, just very quickly, um, wanted to know uh, whether there's like a, a one stop shop for like specific to the, for the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander communities uh, where we can find data that just makes it a lot easier um, for some of the maybe the novices, right? I know here we're, we're among the experts, and if you wouldn't mind and yeah, answering yeah. the question. Yeah, There's an, a cool thing. I, I didn't talk to my uh, boss, Catherine Wallman, but um, 
over the years, there have been interagency groups that have taken on uh, the assembly of data across all of our statistical agencies on a pr particular topic. So there's a wonderful report on the elderly. There's a wonderful report on children. There soon will be one on women and girls. Now, why, does th why do we have to do it that way? Well, we have, you know, 14 or 80, depending on how you count, statistical agencies around the city. And uh, you know this already, right? If you want to find out about the health of the Asian population, you've got to go one place. If you want to know about the job characteristics, you've got to go to another place. And the attempt on these interagency forum, uh, for uh, is uh, to assemble all that so you have it in, in one place. I think I'm a big fan of these things for two reasons. One, uh, it really does serve uh, the, the unsophisticated user groups that don't know that we have 14 different agencies. Uh, two, it tells us what we don't know about that particular topic, and that gives us marching orders for what we ought to be pushing for to get better information. So um, that's my answer to you. Excuse me, Kareem, uh, with all due respect, my question is very central <laughs> to this meeting, and I would like to get permission to pose the question. It has implications for mm -hmm. numerically small, rare populations, both Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders and Asian American subgroups. So I would like, with all due respect, request your permission to ask my question. Okay, so that's fine. We're just going to, if everyone's okay, we're just going to go over, and we probably won't have as much of a break, but we're just trying to be uh, sensitive to... Uh, the schedule, but yes, go ahead. This is another one of our advisory Hello. committee meetings. Salapanapasa, University of Michigan. My question is, po uh, is uh, directed at the data that's out there of the numerically small, rare population that is being suppressed. If you, and if you, you know, I'm speaking to all those federal reports that are being produced by federal agencies whereby numerically small populations are being uh, pre presented as dot dashes and stars. And my question is, the, the census data is one of the best uh, re data resources on these populations. And my, I would like to know what, what is the census, can, how can the census help us? address this uh, data limitation? Are there models that could be used to help do a better job in counting, identifying, and reporting rare small populations? Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Let me, let me define this verb suppress, because that has multiple meetings, right? This is not like WikiLeaks suppress. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's much more like um, the fulfillment of a pledge, right? When, when I knock on your door, or not me, but one of our interviewers, and you give us facts about your, yourself, we give you a sacred pledge. I mean, we, we will go to the death on this pledge. We won't reveal your data. We will do nothing to reveal your identity, nor allow indirectly you to be identified. So when we put out data, especially it's, let me go back to the ACS, these 11 billion estimates we're doing, block groups. You know block groups, just in your own mind, where there's one Asian family in the block group. If we report the characteristics of Asian Americans in that block group, we have revealed that family, right? We don't want to do that because we pledge not to do that. So the suppression is to prevent us or to keep that pledge. So what's the solution? <clears throat> there, there are actually two different solutions. One is aggregation up, right? If, if we aggregated that block group with a lot of other block groups and there are many Asian families, then we could release estimates and no, one, no one's identity would be threatened. We could get better at this uh, to permit this aggregation in wise ways. This will be uh, a general, this will be a general purpose tool for all small area or small population groups. The other thing is modeling, statistical modeling. And if there's a change going on in statistics around the world, it's the realization that uh, combining data from multiple data sets, combining administrative records with survey data, uh, 
finding multiple sources of information and putting them together through statistical models is another tool. So if I were in your seat, uh, if you're an advocate, uh, I would make sure that we're considering statistical modeling in ways that we haven't before. And the federal statistical system, in fact, statistical agencies around the world are not uh, the, the font of all knowledge on this. We're trying to get better at this. This will permit the description, although these are model-based estimates, these won't be counts of people, these will be estimates and of characteristics that is one tool in the future and, you know, put pressure on us to keep doing that. The other uh, traditional way of doing this is oversampling. Groups that are geographically clustered are much easier to oversample than groups that are spread out throughout the entire country. We have an initiative in the 2011, but is it 2011 or 2012? 2011, 2011 budget, uh, by the way, it is impossible to keep, in my little mind, to keep track of these things, that is oversampling the native Hawaiian population because there's a geographical clustering of the native Hawaiian population. You saw those maps of Hawaii, and we can oversample there quite efficiently. Oversampling a group uh, for the ACS. If, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, that budget is in uh, a, a limbo state right now, but that's our, that would be our intent. Oversampling a group where there's one person in every 1,000th block is so expensive that we would have to cut the overall national sample down to a very small level. So the third method depends on the geographical cl clustering. End of answer. Thank you very much for having me.